So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Long Island Backstory with Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs. Hi, I'm Gary Jacobs and welcome to another edition of Long Island Backstory where we're filming at the Cablevision Studios in Hophog, New York. Uh, today, I'm very honored to have uh, an, an esteemed criminal defense attorney and civil litigator with me. Uh, his name is uh, Mir Moza. This man is a real gem and people who watch my show, they often see me criticizing uh, attorneys and I say, you know, there's a, there are always a few good ones and I try to get them on the show and we have had a lot of good attorneys on the show, um, but there are a lot of them that, that aren't good. And when I say this man's a gem, he, he, really, he really is because not only is he an excellent attorney and we're going to talk about all, some of the cases that he's done and why he's different than other attorneys, but I think what makes him really special is that he cares about people. Let's talk about some, some of the cases that you did, and we're going to show, show a, a clip. The first one we're going to show is of, uh, of you on, uh, on BBC, um, and let's show, uh, let's show that clip now. Walk me through the case. What exactly happened? Well, what happened was uh, my clients were charged with a criminal offense, Class A misdemeanor. It's uh, endangering the welfare of a child uh, under the penal law in New York. Obviously, it's a Class A misdemeanor punishable by up to one year in jail. The factual basis is as follows. Uh, Mr. Singer and his wife, my clients, um, had uh, done some uh, shopping uh, in a shopping area of uh, the, Valley, the Valley Stream, Green Acres Mall. Um, they stopped uh, for a very brief period of time to do the shopping, came back to the car, at which time, obviously, uh, two of the kids, one in particular, um, was crying hysterically, wanted to go to the bathroom. Uh, very simply, they made a decision at that point uh, to take both kids, because they both were crying, uh, to take the kids to the bathroom. Uh, at the last minute decision, the little one, baby Rosie, actually was sleeping, well asleep and uh, safe in the car. My client made a decision at that point to leave her, not knowing the geographical location. Obviously, he's just a tourist in the United States. He did not understand and he could not estimate properly the amount of time that it would take him. Uh, from the time he would actually leave the car to the time he actually walks to the bathroom. He assumed it would take only about a minute or so. Uh, obviously, it took a little longer given the fact that it was a much longer distance than anticipated. By the time they actually took the kids to the bathroom, probably about uh, three, four, five minutes passed. At that point, he actually decided to go back to the car, helped his wife tending to the other girl's uh, bathroom needs. Uh, also important to understand that one of the babies had uh, a bladder infection, infection recently, uh, which caused the, uh, the situation to really be exacerbated in a way because it was more urgent. Uh, so obviously when he decided to go and tend to the, tend the girl to the bathroom, obviously um, it was an urgent matter. It was some sort of an emergency. So he had no choice uh, in the matter. Uh, so it took a little longer than one anticipated. By the time he actually returned to the car, uh, the police were there. Someone notified the police that uh, a baby was left out. And obviously uh, my client was uh, arrested. You know, I guess at the first moment I looked, I said, oh my God, what kind of irresponsible people would leave their child in the car? And then I, I listened to you and you had a plausible explanation that it wasn't in, in, intentional. Right. You know, is that like a whole thing that you concocted to get them off? How did, you uh, know, uh, tell us that is story a, that's because a, that's when, a I first heard, I said, when I first read it, I said, oh, these son of a bitches are going yeah. to jail. You leave a dog in the car, you're going yeah. to jail. Uh, let me tell you, the, the distinction was, first of all, there were two British couple. They, they came into the United States as a uh, visitor's vis visa. They came in as tourists. Uh, they came in to do some shopping. They had a rental car. These people are good people from a good background, never had any issue with the criminal justice system here or in the uh, United Kingdom. And they ended up leaving the baby there. She was sleeping. They made a decision at that point not to take her out of the car in the cold and, you know, schlep her into the, the mall. They just needed one. One of the kids needed to go to the bathroom. They had a... We all know uh, when you got a screaming kid. <laughs> and, and what happened was uh, it, 
in sum and substance, what happened was they made a decision, split, split second decision. They went in, they were watching the car while they were out, uh, at least the mother, or at least I, I could recall that. And uh, someone saw the, the, the kid was left there and made a big fuss out of it. The police came and they treated them like real criminals. And, and again, we, we can't condone anything that people right. do against it's babies. It's an honest mistake. It's something that happened. It's a different mentality, you know, in, in, in Europe. There was another Danish case long, long before us uh, that had that same type of, you know, circumstances, and they ended up realizing that in Europe, it's acceptable mode to leave the kid, and, you know, if you supervise him, you leave the kid in, the, you know, with a little bit of uh, air yeah. with the window. As long as you're watching them, you're okay, and right. it's not a crime. Right. In the United States, in New York, it's a totally different ball game. Right. They're doing the wealth of a child. You leave your child for <laughs> 10 seconds, and, and you could yeah. be charged I, with I a crime. I laugh because so. I'm in the pet business, and I go to Scandinavia a lot, and there, everybody travels with their, their pet, their yeah. dog. And everywhere you go, everybody's dog is in the car. The window's cracked. Yep. Some of them have a thermometer so that others can <laughs> see that the temperature is not too high. Right. And it's totally, you don't even think twice about it. And if, if people in the United States, you know, they see a dog in the car, they're, they're smashing the window with the Absolutely. brick in two Absolutely. seconds. The car could be running with the Absolutely. air conditioning blasting and somebody's smashing the window. They, they had a it's mannequin. Cultural. They had a mannequin in Westchester two weeks ago and she was just sitting there. This was a guy who was doing medical uh, examinations on, on, on mannequin. And uh, they broke the car. They thought that <laughs> they there was a body. Yeah, they thought it was a body there. Yeah. They, they broke the window. Yeah, so and it, he got upset. And, and, and then they passed an ordinance that said, no more mannequin in the car. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. So I, it shows you that kind of mentality <laughs> that, that we're, so, we're very apprehensive. So what about happened with this couple? Did they get? Well, we ended up It's got to be scary dismissed. for somebody from another country getting charged oh, with, uh, it was, with the crime. It was horrendous. It was, it was very scary for them. The BBC got involved. All of the media in, in, in the United Kingdom was involved. It, it was just a whole, uh, all ado about nothing, in my opinion. Right. We ended up getting the case dismissed, and uh, they but went back to the I can see if United. it went the wrong way. You look at the way, you know, when it's on the news, and everybody says, this horrible British couple yeah. left their child in the car. How dangerous, you know, it could have been. And there we, was a backlash. Not right. there, there was a backlash. A lot of the, a lot of the people did say exactly well, that, but they, isn't they were not aware of the actual circumstances. The circumstances. Right, I think yeah. someone met a, uh, an infection. Yeah, there, there's, you know, there, there's two sides to every story. So, yeah. you know, to, to see it in a plain language, in a, in a plain way that it is, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's pretty bad. But when you start looking at all the circumstances, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't like they neglected the kid and left her there for, you know, an hour and, the, you know, the kid cried. It wasn't anything like that. She was sleeping. They went in. They came out. By the time they came out, you know, it was Nassau County police all over. So, uh, What about uh, the, uh, the Beagle case? Tell me about the Beagle case. Beagle was a very, very interesting case. The Beagle case involved a woman, an elderly woman that had a companion dog and ended up uh, needing that dog. And, uh, you know, the co-op just adamantly denied the right to, uh, to the dog. And what we did was we presented four different medical opinions that unequivocally came to a conclusion that she needed the dog as a companion. She was sick, she was ill, she was very old, and she needed that. And this is a, this is a standard that's acceptable in, in the Constitution, you know. So uh, if you have a, you know, a companion dog or a guide dog or whatever it is, they cannot discriminate against you. So we tried to convey that message to them and to the co-op, and they just refused to listen. So what we did was we filed a lawsuit we ended up going to federal court. Department of Justice actually joined us with really? that. Yes, Department of Justice. Uh, we had a meeting with the with their lawyers, uh, and the Department of Justice also had been uh, in uh, downtown Brooklyn, uh, whereby I presented the case and I was willing to proceed with that all the way, uh, and they ended up um, they ended up capitulating. They ended up they ended up. Uh, the so woman died. The case. woman died. By the way, oh, she died not because of the dog, right. but she died, you know, midway to uh, whatever it was with the case. And uh, uh, sh the husband or the widower at least felt that some of the blame should be on the fact that they took the dog because she was so happy, and they ended up taking the dog. And when we came in, we fought for justice. We fought to make sure not that she gets the dog back, because obviously she was deceased, but to make sure that number one, the widow. The widower 
is going to get properly compensated for the, you know, the uh, grievance and, and everything it had to go through and the, the uh, discrimination. And number two, we insisted on the board, on the co-op board, which is a fairly big co-op. It, it, it manages a lot of, uh, a lot of apartments there. Uh, that there would be some kind of a resolution changing their attitude and their bylaws to allow guide dogs and to allow companion dogs, right. which is what, which was the main thrust of our case. It wasn't just about money. There was a monetary settlement uh, that, that we reached, but at the same token, we mandated them, and the, the Department of Justice joined us with that to make sure that they change those bylaws, and we set a precedent. So that's case law. We precedent. set a precedent, absolutely, and since then, people have used that case in order to rely on it, in order to make sure that they get their own uh, their own rights. And, and, and that's actually, you know, right now there's a big issue. A lot of people coming back uh, from Iraq, Afghanistan. They have these dogs that they've seen help them Correct. with PTSD, and there are places. Uh, I have a guy that I helped who went into 7-Eleven. And they told him he couldn't come in with his service dog because a big strapping guy. He looks Absolutely. good. You don't know what's going on in the guy's head. Absolutely. And the dog gives him security. And the 7-Eleven owner kicked him out of the store. Discriminatory. And uh, Discriminatory. I think he should have called Mir Moser because he didn't know this touches, to <laughs> this touches a very raw nerve because I'm a big dog lover. Right. I'm an animal rights lover, uh, uh, advocate. So uh, that, that, that case was not only something that I wanted to fight for monetarily. That, that case really touched a raw nerve for me because I really felt that someone who is an elder woman who is in need of a companion dog who is doing good for her that dog was uh, not a menace not to anyone it was a problems. poodle it was, you know. no, was like people. a terrier poodle I mean right. come on I, you're gonna fight this woman right. you're, you're gonna let her you know die from sorrow right. and that, that 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 called into a, a big fight right. so uh, I, I fought that case feverishly Tell us I about the, uh, the force case, which is how I, I, I came to know you. And, and when I speak to the, uh, the forces, they just keep telling me what a godsend okay. your Moses is. And, and he's the only person who's ever feeling like they said he's like family to us. He's, Robert, he just feels like he really cares about the right thing. Robert, and this is not a criminal case. So no, tell no, us about this no, case. Not, not at all. Robert and Donna Force, good clients of mine, uh, ended up almost becoming like family to me because that's how involved I was and still involved in the case. It's in federal court, by the way. It's, uh, it's in litigation. Uh, the uh, county, the Tsego County, uh, took uh, the property for because Robert Force and his wife, who's handicapped, he's a, a military uh, veteran, uh, they ended up paying late the property taxes, and the government or the uh, municipality just um, you know, denied their rights Did they to take, take it back. Money at one point? They, they took they money. They took them, the money. They took they the money. They put it in no. escrow. Right. They put it in their escrow they account, the and they still took that uh, property Same. and sold it away. And you know, Same. you're talking about a guy who's got 25 years in the, in the military. The Absolutely. His wife's His got wife, MS. MS. She walks. Same. She's a handicapped. And this property really meant everything to them. They owned it for a very long time. They were delinquent in you know in a few days. They were able to come back and try to reclaim. And we are one of the one of the things that we argue in is that they were placed in a different perspective, in a different placement than very similarly situated individuals who surprisingly were allowed to keep the, the properties. And so uh, we're going after it's still in litigation. Why do you so. think they did? You think it's an issue of somebody wanted the property, they didn't like that they didn't live in the county, they wanted locals. Do you know why? I mean, you know, why would people Siegel, do this to somebody? That Otsego County has got rules of their own, and they got their own agenda and how they run things. They, uh, you know, they, they claim that they didn't know that she was handicapped when she was there with the, Who cares? You know, it's just they, America. The guy falls, even if he fell behind two, you should lose your farm because, uh, because they get a lien on it and say when they pass away, we get our taxes. I, I, I absolutely insane. agree with you. And, and, you know, from, a, from an emotional point of view, this, again, this touched a raw nerve for me to see how Donna Force felt about that loss. She, until today, she takes this personally because she was the one that was supposed to send the, the check. Uh, and, and for whatever reason, medical reasons, she didn't do it on time. I mean, it's not the end of the world. You, you know, you want to charge them the penalties. Man, you want to charge them, I, you know, I assessment fees. For paying late. You know, oh do whatever you got to do. Really? And they were willing to pay anything at that point just to keep that farm. That farm meant the whole life. And you know, for me to see a veteran fighting for his rights, fighting for his property, and his wife who's, who's handicapped, just 
you know, touch my heart, and I, I, I will do everything I can with that case. Uh, well, thank you for thank you for taking it. I know I, I really you really saved this these people, and they were just in total despair, and now they yeah. have hope. They went to about twenty lawyers, oh, by they the way. Were telling and, uh, me about the hope. lawyers said that the case was too complicated; right. they were, they weren't going to even touch but it. But you know what I find interesting yeah. about the way you handled it? You broke it down to correct. It seems to me dissected. Sometimes it. you look at this big case. People have come to me; I need help, and they bring me a stack this big. I'm not that smart. I can't remember everything. It's too right. comp. And if I can't comprehend it, certainly right. nobody else, a judge isn't going to want to look at it. But you like broke this, you talked about it in three minutes. You explained yeah. the, the crux of the case. Of course, there's more detail. Absolutely. But, but you broke it down. I think maybe that's one, one of your skills that you could take something <laughs> and break it down and make it understandable. 22 years experience will do that. Not, you know, so that's a good thing. So <laughs> tell me about uh, the drug money honey case. <laughs> ah, that was a funny case. Uh, you know, the, these two guys, uh, they, they were married and they, they were on a honeymoon. Uh, they were dealing some uh, ecstasy and hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is going back to, you know, I think it was 2003, 2004. And this was, uh, you know, a high publicity case. This was from Brooklyn. And they ended up claiming that the money came in from, uh, from the wedding gifts because they, they just got married. So right. it, it really got commingled. Uh -huh. It got commingled <laughs> and uh, ended up uh, saving them from major, major uh, jail time. We ended up uh, doing some restitution, pled, pled this case out. Uh, the wife, we pretty much had it walked out. Uh, the mother was, you know, mother was uh, exonerated completely. So uh, it ended up in, in, in a good adjudication, good disposition. Uh, and uh, they kept some of the gifts uh, that, that they got. <laughs> they so yeah, they kept some of the gifts. And uh, it, it, was, it, a was, fun, it was a funny case. Uh, I had a very similar case with uh, with the Hasidics uh, that that came in and, and out of uh, of Belgium and Israel and and um, made it seem like this was diamond. And one of my main guys uh, was involved in that, and uh, I uh, got him off on six months. Everybody else did like 20 years. How do you so feel when, when one of your clients that you represent gets jail time? Do you? I mean, do you have to separate? I mean, I would imagine that you get to know these people very well because I'll you're spending a lot of time. In like, many cases, yes. And uh, like cases. some you don't like, but I'm sure some you do like. And well, then some cases, Gary, you, you know you're going to get jail time. I mean, you got forcible rape. You got forcible, uh, you know, robberies with a person who has priors and you know a victim that got injured. I mean, you prepare that. You prepare right. to it. Uh, but I think that you have to put it in perspective, and your goal is always to try to do the best that you can for your client and try to exonerate him, try to prove that uh, that he wasn't, that it wasn't that bad, that the aggravating circumstances are outweighed by the mitigating circumstances. Uh, but you should be prepared. You know, you, you got to have the stomach. So uh, you prepare your, do you prepare your clients and say, hey, look, this is not, you're going to get, I'm going to, you're going to get some jail time? Well, or? Let me tell you, I, I, I have such experience in my background that when I take a case and someone comes to me, I already know what I'm going to be able to get this guy based yeah. on the circumstances. I mean, just like, like if, if you're a mechanic and, and you see how you're going to fix the car, I, I could see it right in front of me. You come in, you tell me the case, you give me the circumstances, you give me the facts, and I, I know the law, and I could tell you I'll know pretty much where I right. could guarantee this guy what he's going to do. What about plea bargain? And we're not in a, we're not in a business of guarantee. Right, you know? Of course you can't but, guarantee, but you have in your head. But I, I, I absolutely, after 22 years experience, right. I, you know, I'll get that. What about plea bar bargaining versus trial versus bench trial? Oh, plea bargaining is, is, is a gem. Plea bargaining is, is, is really, it's invaluable for the criminal justice system, both for the defense and for the uh, prosecutor. If the prosecutor was forced to take every single case to trial, the whole criminal justice system would fall on its face. They, they just don't have the manpower. They don't have the ability. They don't have the, you know, the, the know-how to try every case. So obviously you need a mechanism in which to plea bargain. Plea bargain is an art in and of itself. If you are a criminal lawyer and you don't know how to plea bargain, it's basically like, uh, you know, like raising a kid without knowing how to feed them. Right. You know, you have to know. It's an indispensable part of your practice. 99.9% .9 of cases that I end up doing is through plea bargain, yeah. either to a dismissal, uh, a German contemplation of dismissal, knocking off a felony to a, a violation, which is equivalent to a traffic infraction. So it's indispensable for me. It saves a lot of money to the client. It saves aggravation of having to go through trials and jury trials, and it, it, it's a mental 
a drainage mm -hmm. on, on a client. I have, as a criminal lawyer, you have to know which cases are worthy to go to trial because you have a very strong case, mm -hmm. and which cases that individual that you're representing, the client, has the stomach and the mm -hmm. mental capacity in which to take to a trial. It's a very long process, Gary. And it takes months, sometimes years, to get to a, a jury trial. It's a risk, you, you never know. I had cases that, you know, you never know. Right. Uh, but it's something that you have to know how to tailor it to the right case, to know that you're maximizing the chances, that you've exhausted all avenues with respect to the plea bargain, and no matter what you do, you cannot get justice unless you have a trial. I had a, a case like this uh, a, a few months ago where a guy was accused of by three complainants uh, of hitting and running uh, with major injuries and what have you. And we went to trial. We, the, the guy would not take anything, not even an ACLD and a German complex of dismissal, a violation. He wouldn't take anything. He and he had to stop. He to wanted to make sure these girls who were lying, who were falsely accusing him, he wanted to give them their day in court and have his day in court. We took it to, to the case to trial. We ended up getting not guilty on all of the counts by all three complainants. And guess what? He's suing them now. We're representing him mm -hmm. against those three for malicious prosecution, mm -hmm. for filing a false instrument, for filing a false report, and for maliciously uh, maligning him and, 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 and putting him to the criminal justice system. We're seeking punitive damages. We're seeking attorney's fees and we're seeking compensation for him. So the tables have turned, turned yeah. absolutely. In, in and we'll do that, Good. we will do that. We That's will important. make sure that those people who are wrongfully accusing our clients will be brought what if to justice. What if it's the county? Well, if it's the county, it's a different ball game, but you could still you could still file a lawsuit against the county. You just have to file a notice of claim for the wrongful arrest. But keep in mind, you can't hold the officers responsible because they have immunity. Can't hold the DA responsible; they have immunity. Right. So what you do is you file a lawsuit vicariously against the county right. and try to get the county accountable. We had a case like this. I had a case like this with a guy who was wrongfully accused by the police officer. Went to a, a grand jury. Grand jury came back with a, a no true bill. They felt that those guys planted the evidence on him and they trusted him. They believed his testimony. We ended up filing a lawsuit against Nassau County. We ended up getting $100,000 in uh, compensation. So I think they need to be kept in check once in a while. In the, in the closing minutes, I have a question about perjury because in family court, again, I'm going back to what I know, <laughs> it happens all the freaking time. Yeah. And I actually had a judge, a sitting judge say, I'm not saying we condone it, but we don't really care if it happens because we just know that it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. I've been told that you know, police officers, it's just a known fact that police officers will commit perjury. We don't do anything. Is there, does anybody care about perjury here? Oh, there's no question about it. You care about perjury, but it's a diff very difficult aspect of the law to prove. Just by disproving that what you say is not true doesn't mean that you lied. There's a lot of gray area. In order to prove that you, you committed perjury, you really have to show a very specific contradiction to what your testimony is, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Does the county ever go uh, after the prosecutor ever? I tell you, I had, a case, I had a case in Jersey uh, a few years ago where we had proven unequivocally that the individual that testified testifies falsely. We showed, you know, the, uh, the paperwork that he submitted. It was a, uh, contradicting to his uh, affidavit that he filed with the court. So we brought it to the DA's office in, uh, I think it was Bergen County. We gave him everything, Gary, on a silver platter. Nothing. They came back to us and said, we agree with you, this was perjury, but because of the workload, we don't have the time to prosecute. Sure. Uh, therein lies your answer. Right. They don't take perjuries uh, as you and me would like them to and hold people responsible and accountable for lying on the oath, because that's really what this is all about. Absolutely. I mean, in my, in, in, in my, in my divorce case, for, for example, my ex-wife went and claimed that I hit her in front of my daughter. We, we went, we, we went to trial, we, we adjudicated it, I was found not guilty, and she sends an apology letter to the DA <laughs> saying, I'm sorry I lied, he never did hit me. The DA turns the letter over to my attorney. I then go to the police, and I say, here's proof. She filed a report that I hit her. Here's her letter to the DA saying, I lied and he didn't do it. They wouldn't even take a report from me. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I said, how do you not do that? It's outrageous, it, it's outrageous. Uh, it, 
There's no explanation. No. There's no condoning. I know it. you don't have an answer I had, for no, it. I had one case that I remember that was a, a perjury and, a, and filing a false instrument. I was able to prove he, he charged my client with grand larceny for stealing 20000 We had a tape-recorded conversation after my client was actually arraigned and you know, brought to court Spent and brought to trial. Jail. We actually had the uh, audio tape from the conversation where he's telling him, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to go to the cops and tell him. It's extortion, and it was perjury because he filed a false instrument saying under oath wow. that he stole. But we had that, that tape. We ended up dismissing the case against my client, using that as leverage Civil. against him. No, as leverage against him, and he was prosecuted. Oh, he was? He was. Good, good. That was the one get. case, yes. Mir Moza, thank right. you very much for coming my on the show. We could talk all day, my but uh, we're out Absolutely. of time. Hopefully, I never have to hire you. But if anybody I'm watching, here. you know what? Uh, we got good people. Again, I'm Gary Jacobs, and thank you for joining us at Long Island Backstory. Thank you very much to, to my guest, uh, Mir Moza. Uh, I'm sure you could find him uh, on the internet. You can Google him. Plenty of things come up. Uh, and we'll see you again next week. Long Island Backstory. Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs is uncovering the truth on Long Island. The family court system. Red light cameras. Corruption in local politics. The heroin epidemic. Corrupt judges. At Long Island Backstory, we uncover the truth that the Cablevision news monopoly won't dare touch. We uncover the details you won't see on News 12 or in Newsday. We are local independent media at its best. Long Island Backstory, available on Public Access TV and on YouTube. Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory.